The Old Testament reading for the 14th Sunday after Trinity is from Proverbs chapter 4. Hear my son and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction, do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it, do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with the gradual together. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning, and your faithfulness by night. The epistles from Galatians chapter 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Excuse me, there is additional reading. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has saved you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Normally we hear this text for Thanksgiving, and rightly so. This text puts before us the proper place of giving thanks where thanks is due. But today this text comes on the heels of the last two Sundays where we heard the questions asked, am I my brother's keeper and who is my neighbor? Jesus not only teaches on these two questions, but he himself is shown to be his brother's keeper and a neighbor 
to the one in need. But these aren't the first lepers that Jesus comes across in his earthly ministry. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus met a man full of leprosy. And the man asked Jesus, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And his request was granted. And Jesus then charged the man, go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. This man requested of Jesus to be made clean, to be cleansed of the leprosy that plagued him, that the endless suffering of leprosy would be ended. And the leprosy left him. The man had been cleansed. But now Jesus encounters not one leper, but ten. And what they cry out to Jesus is wholly and completely different than what the man cried out for in Luke chapter 5. These ten cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They're not crying out for cleansing, but for mercy. It's the same thing that the church cries out for every Lord's Day in the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. It's the first prayer spoken during the divine service. During the intro, the pastor ascends the steps to the altar in the chancel, showing forth that we are now at that point during the intro, entering into the presence of God Almighty who sits on the altar. And then that first prayer that's placed upon your lips, the lips of the faithful, is the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy. Your cry for healing, for cleansing, for pardon, for salvation. That's what these ten lepers are crying out to Jesus for. They want salvation. Salvation that's found only in Jesus. And Jesus tells them as well to go. And as they go, doing what Jesus had told them to do according to the law of Moses, they are cleansed. And it's really easy for us to come down on those nine lepers who were cleansed, who didn't come back to give thanks to Jesus, but they were just doing what Jesus told them to do, what the law of Moses commanded them to do. And the one who returns is a Samaritan. He's not exactly going to be a welcomed person in Jerusalem and the temple. But there's more going on than that. The Samaritan, according to what St. Luke records, recognized what had happened and that it could only have occurred by the hand of God. This Samaritan, this foreigner, Recognize that Jesus is God in the flesh, who had made him whole, who had cleansed him, and who had shown mercy. St. Luke records these words. When he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. It is meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to God. And so the Samaritan goes back to Jesus, to God in the flesh, to thank him. And Jesus is the great high priest. This Samaritan does show himself to the priest. But this priest doesn't make sacrifices of sheep or bulls he doesn't sprinkle the blood of beasts on the altar in the temple. This great high priest sacrifices himself. This great high priest sheds his own blood on the altar of the cross. And this man returns to this great high priest because he's received mercy for which he cried. 
So when things in life hit the fan for you, or when the door does hit you on the way out, what do you cry? Where do you go? Far too often, even for devoted Christians who attend church every Sunday, we go to God last, when we have no other options left. Week after week, the prayer of the Kyrie goes by without much thought to it. When life drags you down, when you're faced with the unrelenting criticisms from other people, when you're dealing with hardships and illnesses and family trials and death, you search for answers and advice from anywhere you can take it. And even more so, when your conscience doesn't let you sleep, and the memory of the sins that you have done, and those things that you have failed to do, maybe even asking yourself, am I my brother's keeper, or who is my neighbor? And you stay awake late at night, and you stare at that little glowing box in your hand, and you go to Pastor Google, and try and find some answers online. Or you listen to a message from one of those prosperity preachers or those faith healers, but they don't help. In fact, all of these things that we try, the many and various ways that we attempt to soothe our consciences and find relief from what plagues us in life, they end up leaving us in, in an even deeper despair because they turn us back on ourselves. So what's left? What was left for the ten lepers who were ostracized from society lest they infect others with their disease? What hope did they have? What hope do you have? To whom do you cry out for help? The sin that rots you away, that strips eternal life from you, and that pits you brother against brother and neighbor against neighbor, that makes you ask the questions, am I my brother's keeper? Who is my neighbor? And in doing so, we try to justify ourselves to declare ourselves righteous for our own sake. But it doesn't bring us any peace, and if it does, it doesn't last long. Because self-justification never brings hope. But it leaves us in despair. There's only one thing to do. But you don't have to wait until you hit rock bottom. Sometimes God does drive us down to hit rock bottom. And he forces us to look to him, to cry out, Lord, have mercy. But you don't have to wait. First, look to the commandments of God. Not for something that you have to do to earn his favor, but look to his commandments and recognize yourself in them. For we heard wisdom speak in our Old Testament lesson this morning, Hear, my son, and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. So hear the word of the Lord. Hear his holy commandments. Recognize yourself in them and say, These I have not kept, and for it I deserve death and hell. There is only one answer. There is only one hope. There is only one plea. There is only one to whom I can flee for refuge. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. For Jesus is your great high priest who hears your pleas for mercy. And he is your forgiveness, life, and salvation. He is the priest, and he is the victim. He is the sacrifice appointed by the Father 
to pay for the sins of the world, to pay for your sins. Who sheds his blood, who lays down his life for you. His sacrifice is the proof of the Father's love for you. His resurrection is the proof of the Father's accepting his sacrifice. And now your baptism is your proof of God's assurance of your salvation. For the word of God says what it does and does what it says. For we cry out, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And what follows the Kyrie in the liturgy of the church is the Gloria in Excelsis. That's God's answer to your plea for mercy. The song of the angels sung to the shepherds who were keeping their flock by night. The liturgy is showing you every Sunday that Jesus is the answer to your plea for mercy. That the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary and laid in a manger, is your priest and your sacrifice. It's to him that you flee for refuge. It's to him that you cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. And he has mercy on you. And he forgives you. You are cleansed from that life-rotting sin that infects you, that pits you against God, that pits you brother against brother and neighbor against neighbor. The blood of Jesus is sprinkled on you. The blood of Jesus, your sacrifice, is on you. The blood of your great high priest. And after the Samaritan falls on his face and worships at the feet of Jesus, the Lord Jesus tells him, Arise, journey. Your faith has saved you. The word that St. Luke uses there literally means to journey, not to go your way, as the English Standard Version renders it, but to journey with Jesus to Jerusalem, to the upper room, to Gethsemane, to the hall of Pilate, and to Golgotha, where the sacrifice takes place as a proof of the cleansing flood of forgiveness. Your faith has saved you. Again, the ESV fails us in this translation. It doesn't mean, and it, your faith has made you well. I don't know why we keep translating that word in that way. It doesn't mean healed you. It means saved you. Because the, the man cried out not for healing, but he cried out for mercy. And Jesus is the first place that you flee. Yes, you consult with your family and your friends. Yes, you take comfort from other Christians who speak the word of God to you. In all times of hardships, trials, and heartaches, in all times of sorrow and grief, in all times of depression, anxiety, and loneliness, in all times of mourning over sin, both of what you have done and what you have failed to do, you turn to Jesus and cry out to him for mercy because he will never let you down. He will never fail at showing you mercy. And even now, right now, at this very moment, you sit in the presence of the Almighty God who has heard your plea for mercy in the Kyrie. And his response is not hidden. His response is not a secret. But we sang the words of the angels, glory to God in the highest. And we hear Jesus say, arise, journey. Your faith has saved you. For Jesus is your keeper. Jesus is your neighbor. 
He cleanses you of sin. He comforts you in sadness. He gladdens you with his love. And he strengthens you and gives you courage. And as you journey with Jesus each Sunday to the cross and the empty tomb, he journeys with you from this place to your home, to your work, to your school, and each and every day of your life because you're baptized, you're cleansed, you're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, and in your baptism, Jesus says to you, you are mine. And no one, absolutely no one, can snatch you out of my hand. And so there is a lot for us to be thankful for, not just at Thanksgiving, but each and every day. But above all, we give thanks to God for Jesus, our high priest, for the all-atoning sacrifice, for his mercy, and for his cleansing. For the mercy that Jesus showed to the lepers redounded in worship at the feet of Jesus. And in worship today, it's not something you do for God, but what God is doing for you through his word and through his sacraments to cleanse you, to give you life to the full in him who is the resurrection and the life. In the name of Jesus, amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.